so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be representing Herefordshire Mind here today. The origins of today's event um, came from some reflection on our 40 years of existence that we're celebrating this year. And back in 1995, we published a book called Boots on Out. And it's personal testimony from inmates, and I use the words, ad words advisedly, and some staff from the lunatic asylum called St Mary's, uh, just outside Hereford in a village called Berg Hill. The foreword to that book was written by one of our panel, Dr Lucy Johnston, and within that there was a sentence that really highlighted what I wanted to try and achieve with this event. So, from 1995 to 2018, and here we are this afternoon, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, next to me um, is Paul Farmer, CBE. Paul has been Chief Executive of National Mind since 2006. He is also the Chair of the NHS England Mental Health Task Force and has recently co-published Thriving at Work with Lord Stevenson. Next to Paul is Dr Lucy Johnston, a clinical psychologist, trainer, speaker, writer and a long-standing critic of the biomedical model of psychiatry. Lucy's authored several books, most recently The Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Diagnosis, which I believe may be available for sale. Next to Lucy is Joe Watson, a psychotherapist, a performance artist, a trainer, an activist with a professional history in the rape crisis movement of the 1990s. Joe founded a Facebook group called Drop the Disorder in 2016 as a place where the issues surrounding the biomedical model can be discussed. And together, Lucy and Joe now are running events up and down the country called A Disorder for Everyone, challenging the culture of psychiatric diagnosis amongst many other issues. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our panel. I would stress that I want this discussion to be participative, but I thought an initial starting point should be possibly our panel's thoughts on State of the Nation. 2018, where are we? There's lots of talk about mental health in the media and elsewhere. What does that mean and what are our thoughts? So, Paul, would you like to kick mm. us off? Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here and particularly to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Herefordshire Mind. And uh, like many uh, of our 130 local minds up and down the country, what I really love about the work that our local minds do is that you are a community-based organisation really responding to the needs of your local community. And 40 years ago, that's exactly what you were doing. But in a very particular way, you were responding to the fact that uh, a, a large asylum had, uh, was entering its closure process, uh, like most asylums around the country. Um, and you were there for people uh, with uh, very long-term mental health problems in many cases, uh, many of whom will have spent, would have spent many years in that asylum uh, environment. And you were there to provide help and support for people um, who were, uh, in the phrase at the time, a horrible phrase, was, uh, was people who were being decanted from the system. And you were there because um, probably friends, fam family members, local civic leaders recognised that there was a need for a community to respond. Fast forward 40 years and... Um, like many local minds, you've, uh, you've, you've responded to the changing face of mental health in our society. Um, those asylums are now long gone, almost certainly turned into uh, luxury flats or uh, shopping centres. Um, instead, uh, we now have a different way of thinking about how we support people with mental health problems. Um, and as part of that, a local mind, a local mind association like yourselves responds to being much more of a community organisation and we probably wouldn't be in this room today if we weren't thinking about uh, the whole community and thinking about the mental health of all the community. Um, and so in a sense uh, your journey reflects I think the journey that 
that we have, are moving on as a society because what we've seen is a change in the way that the public is talking about mental health as an issue. Um, we've also seen, uh, as a result of far more people with their own personal lived experience of mental health problems, standing up and talking about their experiences, which is probably the most fundamental change that's happened in the, most, in the last 40 years. As a result of that greater voice of people with lived experience, We've seen the public, friends, family, colleagues, and others pay notice, take notice. Uh, we've also seen uh, the media take notice, and we've seen politicians take notice. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we, have a, we are having a, and it's a bit of an overused phrase, but we are having a conversation about mental health like we've never had before. But at the fundamental heart of it, we still, uh, despite a lot of that progress, I think we should be very pleased about and recognise as progress, um, we also know that there are huge fundamental challenges that we still, uh, we still face. So we know about the significant underfunding of uh, mental health services. We know about the very negative experiences that people with mental health problems have, for example, with the welfare system. Um, and we also know uh, that it is still uh, an area, particularly if you experience the most serious mental health problems, where that stigma is still there. So um, I suppose part of my job at MIND is to be a glass half full kind of person, because I think it's very important that we look positively back, um, uh, but also recognise that we've got a huge uh, challenge ahead of us. So uh, I think I'll probably stop at that point and, okay. and we'll open up for discussion uh, later. But uh, I think we've got Good, we've made significant progress in that 40-year period, but my goodness, we've got a long way to go. Paul, thank you. Lucy, State of the Nation. State of the Nation, OK. One of the things I always think about when I think about mental health changes, and I've been in this business for a long time, is it seems to be there's a curious paradox in psychiatry, by which I mean the whole system, not just a profession of psychiatrists, in that everything changes and yet everything stays the same. So we've no doubt seen, we have seen huge changes. We've seen a raft of reorganisations. We have new kind of titles for teams. We have a slew of documents, you know, nearly all of which have some, at least something useful to say. We have even some kind of different professions and so on. We have a new high profile aspect of conversations, as Paul's just said. Yet in some fundamental change ways, it seems to me we are yet to get to grips with what we call mental health is actually all about and I think it doesn't take very long to kind of work out that something is amiss because and this is where I think calls for more funding though understandable don't really get to the heart of the problem you know we seem to be in a heading towards a state where almost everyone in the country is going to be on a pill of some sort or another and indeed almost everyone's going to have a diagnosis <laughs> so you know, the country doesn't seem to be getting men mentally healthier, if you like, and nor do we seem to be coming up with treatments that actually seem to be reducing the incidence of what we might call mental ill health or mental health problems. So I guess from my point of view, and we'll expand on this, I'm sure I'm looking for much more fundamental changes than more funding, more awareness, uh, more people able to speak openly about their struggles. Of course, I welcome all those things, but I don't think we're going to get out of this cycle where we actually seem to be going downhill rather than uphill in terms of the prevalence of mental health problems unless we start thinking about it in a fundamentally different way. So this leads on to our theme really about the power of words and language. A lot of what we need to change in my view has to start with language. We use the med medical language, we talk very often uncritically about mental illness, we accept uncritically categories like personality disorder and schizophrenia and major depression. We'll talk about this, no doubt. None of these are scientifically valid categories, and they imply a whole way of thinking which has not really got us very far, which actually needs to change. To put it at its simplest, we need to move from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you, and from thinking about patients with illnesses to people with problems and stories. And I look forward to discussing that more in a minute. Thank you, Lucy. Joe, um, from a practitioner's perspective, cause for hope? Cause for hope? Um, a little bit, I think. Okay. The debate is getting more widely out there. People are talking about the issues more. But I'm still seeing, I'm still seeing people that have come sometimes from services with diagnoses and 
they've internalised this kind of medicalised way of understanding their distress to the point sometimes that it's part of their identity. So they come to therapy with that understanding and it's no surprise to me because wherever they look for information about what they're experiencing, they're faced with a biomedical narrative everywhere they look. So for example, if you've got a young person who's experiencing quite severe moods, they might Google that and actually bipolar disorder is the first thing that comes up in relation to search engines, same with any other ways of experiencing life. So, for, for example, if a young person's hearing voices, they might put that into Google, because young people do that these days, <laughs> I believe. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, do, I did that experiment of, you know, often where, I, where I'll search these, these words, and almost immediately you've got, you know, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, mm. all these mm. medicalised ways of understanding distress. And my thing is that no other... Um, way of understanding distress is widely available. It's not accessible for people to, to kind of have and to look at, so that they can maybe potentially make sense of their distress in a different way. So. Thank you, Joe. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard some opening statements from our panel. <laughs> <coughs> um, who's going to be the brave individual to ask first question or make a first comment? I think the danger is that the diagnosis, whether it's depression or schizophrenia or borderline personality disorder, becomes the explanation for the distress. And there's a danger that stories are obscured, stories aren't told, meaning isn't made. I think Lucy can talk a lot more about that. Mm. Okay, Lucy, yes, yeah, that? do. do. Um, luckily, there is an excellent book to help you think <laughs> through these dilemmas. <laughs> And the starting point of this book is unpicking what diagnosis can and can't do for you. And it's really not a book about you are not allowed to use these words about yourself because I strongly believe in people's right to make their own sense of their own experience. But I believe equally strongly that people need to be encouraged to consider a ways of making, a number of ways of making sense of their experience. As Joe says, those alternatives are not very often available. So, I mean, I fully accept that that's a way of thinking that makes sense to some people. My question is, are they ever asked alternatives? I fully accept in the current system, you know, we're in a state of what I hope is evolution towards a revolution where you need your diagnosis for some purposes, you know, so it's not about stripping people of their diagnoses so they can't access benefits. But these are not actually explanations in the sense that people usually receive them. It's like... Why do you feel so desperate and miserable because you have depression? How do you know do you have depression because you're so desperate and miserable? Every single diagnosis works like that. Why do you hear hostile voices because you have schizophrenia? How do you know you have schizophrenia because you hear hostile voices? So from my point of view, it's a kind of pseudo-explanation. And from my experience working with people, quite quickly the disadvantages, the limits of that explanation become obvious and the disadvantages kick in in terms of stigma and perhaps dependence on drugs that are not going to be the answer to your problem. And we do have alternatives, and I may talk about this more in a bit, mm. but one of the alternatives I've been very much involved in is a kind of promoting, which a lot of professionals use, is something called formulation, which in essence a structured way of helping someone to put together a story. So rather than, you know, it was, my, it was depression that hit me, it might be something like an accumulation of events, you know, built on lack of confidence from my early life and triggered by really difficult circumstances in the present have brought me to kind of, you know, run into a wall and I actually need to rethink my life with some support. So that, I think, is a better alternative. Okay. Thank you. Paul? Well, I'm already looking forward to this session lasting till about 10.30 tonight. No, 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 because, because, it, because we're already opening up so many really interesting and important conversations. So the, the first one for me, actually, let's just start with thinking about this question of language, because, um, you know, again, back in those asylum days, you know, our, our, the, 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 the legacy of the asylum days is still rooted in our English language today with phrases like round the bend and out of sight, out of mind, which were all coined when people were literally taken away into those big asylums, which had, were built with bends in the road so that people were 
literally taken away from our sight as a society and as a community. And I think in some ways we're still living the legacy of that. Um, we also have in our language a complete... Uh, we're still kind of navigating our way. I think I agree with the way Lucy describes this kind of transitional journey that we're on. Uh, you know, we're navigating our way between what do we mean when we talk about mental health, because when we talk about mental health, what most people immediately think of is mental illness, and they don't tend to think about, they don't tend to think about all our mental health in the way that we tend to think about our physical health. Um, and then we hear people talking about, quite often I come across people who talk about mental health illness, which is in, in and of itself a complete uh, contradiction in terms. Um, and then we have these kind of baskets of symptoms called diagnoses and uh, uh, you know I think there is I, uh, personally and uh, organizationally we see a place for those but we also know that they are remarkably inexact and we know that because uh, we know that mainly because we don't know so much about what's going on inside uh, in, inside ourselves as, as human beings so we, uh, we know that lots of people tell us, and just to come back to your question, a lot of people tell us that they do find um, those being able to use words that explain to other people uh, what they're experiencing. They find that helpful. Uh, in some, for, for, for a significant number of people, they then find they get the kind of help that they need. So that's also pretty important. Um, but we also hear far too often about people who journey across a range of different diagnoses. And I was talking to one of our trustees the other day about this, and she was telling me that she's had six or seven different uh, psychiatric di diagnoses over a kind of 20-odd year period. And I said to her, were you different uh, the first time you went as opposed to the last time you went? She said, not really. So I think there are some challenges that we do have to unpackage. And I think this is where you then get into the question about why do we know what we don't know? And that's partly because uh, there's very limited amount of money being spent understanding this issue. Mm. But also, and I do have a lot of, a lot of, lot of sympathy with the points that Joe and Lucy are making, we are at real danger of pathologising the whole nature of our human condition. And it is, it is completely inappropriate, and you nearly used an inappropriate word then, <laughs> uh, it is completely inappropriate for us to be driving more and more people into mental health services without first examining what it is that they're experiencing and what are the ways in which we can help people. And in that sense, we don't yet have a, have a proper prevention approach towards uh, mental health. We don't think about, or perhaps more accurately, we don't have a more, we don't have a positive approach to thinking about how we build our mental health in a positive way. Again, I think that's beginning to change, but uh, we don't get any of that kind of, uh, we don't get any of those kinds of uh, messages, or we don't, and we don't, we're not really encouraged to think about our mental health in that particular way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes. sure. What? One of the things you said was that diagnosis was inexact, so it's something that we agree on. Um, so let's celebrate that. When somebody gets a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, what they're not told is that it isn't an exact science, there's no scientific evidence for it, that it's a construct, that it was made up around a table of white men in America. Um, they're not told that. Now, it might well be, it might well lead to them... Um, to useful aspects in relation to their experience. They might find it meaningful on some level, but it would be much better if they, were, if they had all the information in which to make that decision in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'd, I'd encourage like, more visibility of that message on your website. That would be a really good start. Okay, thank okay. you. Right. Sorry, can I add briefly to that? Okay, yeah, sorry, well, sorry. Briefly, and then You're to you, right. sir. Um, I mean, adding to both those points, really, I think it's very... Uh, my experience is that the message of actually what's happening at the top in terms of diagnostic manuals and the whole diagnostic system very rarely filters down to professionals, to the general public, to people who use services. Yeah. Actually, whatever we think of the current diagnostic system, it's on the way out. People do not realise this. They have a right to be told it. Yeah. So the chair of the committee that drew up the, most, the second to last edition of di the Diagnostic and St Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the so-called Psychiatrist Bible, Dr Alan Francis has very outspokenly said, there is no reason to believe DSM is safe or scientifically sound. America's largest funding body has stopped funding research into things called bipolar disorder and schizophrenia because it is recognised these are not valid constructs, therefore not a good starting point. So 
and the billions of dollars are being poured into developing new systems on the bottom up with the expectation they won't be ready for use for decades. So this is the bigger context people actually need to know about. These are not scientific facts and truths. These are constructs that are acknowledged even by the people who I would use the, the verb invented them, you know, are you know are not fit for purpose. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, Paul. Uh, oh, well, I thought this might come up. So uh, thank you very much for asking the question. Um, uh, you know, I think, so first of all, just want to be very clear, we don't, um, we, although we as an organisation and many local minds have statutory contracts, um, we enter into those contracts on our own terms, so we're very clear about what we can and can't do, and our independence as a charity is hugely important to us. So it doesn't stop us from speaking up, and it doesn't stop us from speaking out. It, it, well, our work with the, in terms of what we do with the DWP, we do influence the DWP from the inside to do things differently. Uh, and, but we're also not afraid to use external campaigning tools to argue positively where the DWP have got it wrong. And uh, the best example of that most recently is when we supported a court case against a recent PIP uh, judge, against a recent decision by the government to change the personal independence payments uh, uh, benefit, which would have had a massively negative impact on people with mental health problems. And uh, we supported, a, we were very outspoken in our public campaign around that, and we supported a court case which led to the government changing its mind and means that far more people will, with mental health problems will now benefit from that benefit. Um, uh, I think we, uh, we recognise that sometimes that, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's an issue that we have to keep constantly under review uh, and we do that both locally and nationally in the, in the work that we do um, and we do, we're not afraid to tell ministers uh, what, uh, what we think. Um, uh, would I say that our, we have been uh, as successful as I would like us to have been in terms of our campaigning work against DWP? The answer to that is no, because I still think that the benefit system is woefully inadequate when it comes to thinking about treating and supporting, well, supporting people with mental health problems or the way in which it treats people with mental health problems. Uh, so we, but we continue, which is why we continue to campaign on this issue. We see it as being a really important part of what we do. Um, alongside campaigning on a whole variety of, of different issues. So, um, but but it's, an, it's an important part of who we are. Um, and um, just for the record, we don't have any public contracts with the DWP. Do we actually have a positive structure to offer sanctuary and a safe place of safety for someone outside of the confines, maybe, of the, the legal system where um, sectioning and, you know, is, mm. can be brutal and incredibly frightening. Yeah. So what's the alternative? Well, we did used to have some of those alternatives, they, and we still do have some. I think it's a very good point. What a lot of people need is not treatment as such in a medical sense they do need a breathing space they do need someone to talk to someone to be with them they need you know time out from their daily lives I mean when I started working in psychiatry many years ago the pressure on beds was much less and some people came in quite explicitly for that reason and if you were in a hospital in rather beautiful grounds that was often very healing that was not medical treatment yeah. And the trouble is, you know, I, I don't think people should be coming into hospital if they don't need it. Of course mm. not. But what we end up with is wards full of really very acutely distressed people, which are really not sanctuaries of peace mm. and not the mm. place where people need to be mm. and would drive anyone further into distress, in my view. Mm. We do have some very inspiring examples, for example, of crisis houses, things mm. like the Leeds mm. um, survivor-led crisis house, which try to offer exactly that. And again, the, the emphasis I want to make on... That is about, it's the non-medical stuff that's important, and their evaluations show that. Mm -hmm. It's the simple human stuff. It's about being with people, having space, listening, supporting, validating. Mm -hmm. We need far more of that. Now, I, I don't know of many kind of sets of nice guidelines that recommend that, and this is, this is the trouble with getting caught up with a very managerial, very medically-based system. We often miss the human qualities that are actually what people mm -hmm. most need. Yeah, thank you.
can I just pick up immediately on that? Um, from Herefordshire Mind's perspective, we have found our partnership with Ledbury Poetry Festival incredibly valuable. Um, and if you want direct evidence of the power of creativity in a community, go, please go and visit the panelled room in the Master's House where we're exhibiting some of the, the, the work that's been created by some of the participants. It's extraordinary. Uh, and the value of that um, cannot be minimised. But um, anybody want to come back on... I think, on that. I think it's a really important point. I absolutely agree that it has been stripped away and we should be focusing much more on that. When we see examples of that, we see healing happening, we see um, a space where people can make sense of their experience, that can make sense of their, their story without having to, you know, kind of use diagnostic labels to do that because they don't need to. We know that hearing voices, for example, is a normal human strategy to cope with adversity and trauma. We know that we've got the evidence. We've had enough people speaking about it and, and that applies to lots and lots of other um, lived experience. So when people get together and use creativity to share stories, you know, powerful stuff happens. Definitely. I understand what you're saying and to some extent we will have to work within the system as it is and use the strategies that are available to us. So if I was in a position of you could have a million pounds to set up a service for psychosis. I, I would say yes, please, and just kind of try to add these marks around psychosis. Um, I mean, the, the, tr the trouble is it's a, such a much bigger issue, from my point of view, than funding for this service, because unless we get the right kind of service, we can have an infinite number of bloody services. Do, do you know what I mean? We can have every single young person in the country seen by a CAMS team, but is, that seems to be where we're heading, a young person, a child and adolescent mental health team. We really, really, really have to look more at what, what, what the hell it, all this is about. We really do. And that also means calling on the government, but it means making very explicit links between the kind of society we live in, where vast numbers of our young people are in distress, as well as people of all ages, and you know, rising tide of, of you know, peop young people, for example, as we're talking about young people self-harming and struggling with their eating and feeling desperate and feeling ashamed of their bodies and all the rest of it. You know, we live in an increasingly materialistic individualistic and competitive and unjust society. It's not an accident that rates of mental health problems are soaring. It really isn't. And actually, we need to make the link between personal distress and social inequality and injustice. And one of the prime ways of obscuring that link, however well intended, is to apply a diagnosis. It then becomes a case of treating the whatever. We need to take away the label to see with what, what we're actually dealing with, and we need to deal with problems at their source. And we need to, you know, try honestly to create the kind of society we want to live in, which is not one that is rife with so-called mental health problems. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, Paul, do you want to say a few oh, words on this? Oh, just, just very quickly, mm. I, I just wanted to share that I am aware um, of young people in in, in school situations have been, where their school has referred them to cameras. <laughs> Um, and actually what's, what's transpired is that people are prioritised if they've got a diagnosis and the, and the narrative around the school is, I've got to get this diagnosis to get this help. Mm -hmm. So you've got a kind of situation where young people are almost chasing diagnosis and this is really expensive for them in terms of their life. We've got U Bipolar UK describing bipolar as a severe lifelong mental illness that has to be medicated forever, you know. Um, that's... If people are chasing that diagnosis and getting the diagnosis because they do get it, you know, what does that mean for the, for the whole life of that person? Mm. Paul, briefly, and then we'll take some more questions. So I think there is, a, there is actually an opportunity to change the way that we think about some of these issues. And the kind of conversation that we were having earlier about the kind of the benefits of kind of creative input, creative uh, approaches, and I completely agree, by the way, with your point about how people benefit from whether it's music or the arts or poetry or sport, I think is, is important for some people as well. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing, even in, this, you know, in these very tough times, a lot of local voluntary organisations, including a lot of local minds, 
offering those kinds of services. And they normally kind of cobble together a bits and bobs of money from bits and places, different places, national lot, big lottery funds and so on and so forth, to offer those kind of holistic uh, type approaches. And um, people tell us that they really like that kind of approach. In fact, they tell us they prefer that kind of approach to uh, a kind of primary care kind of approach. And that goes even further into crisis because not, the, Lucy's example of the lead sanctuary is a good one, and there are many other um, uh, organisations, a really great organisation, for example, Maytree up in North London, which provides a quiet space for people. Mm. And quiet spaces uh, come in many different shapes and sizes, of course, because they don't, sometimes those quiet spaces for a 14 or 15-year-old is actually a quiet space in their digital world as much as it is in their, in their uh, kind of real world, if you like. So there are different ways that we have to think about how we address this. Now, um, you know, I think there is a chance uh, for uh, the government to think differently about the way in which it thinks about children and young people's mental health. Um, and and I, I want to cheer Lucy up a bit because I can guarantee her that there won't be a CAMS professional for every young person with a mental health problem uh, <laughs> because there just won't be. Uh, I, think there, I think actually that creates the chance for people to get together and work together with young people to identify those approaches that people really find beneficial to help sustain their mental health and I, I, I do use the word men, and it's not won't be universally approved of but I do use that word mental health because I do think that that does help a lot of people understand what we're talking about and uh, we also know from a lot of the work that we've done with the general public that that those that is the kind of language that the public understands and there might be reasons why that's the case but uh, I, do, I think we have got a chance to do some of these things differently. The other dimension to this is also changing the way in which we think about good quality research and evaluation. Um, and uh, for a very long time, a lot of approaches have been dismissed as being not fundable because the, the threshold of the evaluation is not considered to be good enough. Um, and in fact, your, your very own professions in psychology have uh, suffered from that experience for a very long time, um, uh, despite the fact lots of people get real benefit from uh, accessing uh, psych psychological uh, therapeutic interventions um, and and support. So, so I think we do need to also to think a bit more about how we how we're helping uh, government to change the way in which they think about evidence. And my goodness me, we're in a period where evidence is being redefined on an almost daily basis. So maybe the opportunity is greater than we, than we might think if we can get people to agree to some extent on what uh, the right kind of approach is. Are. And I mean, I think we've seen a really good example of this recently in an area where there's been a lot of contention around a diagnostic label of personality disorder, where people have got together and come up with a really strong consensus view opinion about what uh, about how this approach should be how it should be addressed and addressed in a very different way mm -hmm. to ways in which it's been addressed different, uh, previously. I, I just want to make a point to the lady over there about your friend. And, and I mean, it, it's, you know, I think we, it's so important that we, we remind, and this is what we do all the time in the, our work and lots of other people do too, remind people about the consequences of when it goes wrong and the consequences of no, services not being available. And, you know, here we are on the verge of the 70th anniversary of the NHS when lots of people are being very positive about the contribution that the NHS has made to their physical health. Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot about what people are saying about the contribution of the NHS to mental health. Um, and I think that's because people recognise that the last 70 years haven't been a great story for mental health in the NHS. But I do think there's a, a commitment to trying to do things differently. We're seeing more and more organisations up and down the country embracing the trauma-informed model, where, it's where they're looking at what has happened, what not what is wrong, and that is also incorporating really creative work, meaningful work, and I think that that, that philosophy is spreading really quickly, and so for me that's, that's a pretty positive story. Something positive, um, Paul mentioned the personality disorder consensus statement, which can be found on the MIND website, uh, this came out very recently from a committee chaired by Norman Lamb MP and Sue Sibold, as an expert by experience. It actually calls to abandon the label of personality disorder mm -hmm. and to look instead at the histories of trauma and adversity that often lie beneath that label. Great news. 
Minds Leifnitz do need updating a little bit in line with that. And let's herald the abandonment of all the other labels too. Thank you. Paul? Uh, I'd love to take you to Cambridge, uh, where the local mind uh, works with uh, a very wide range of different groups of people. Uh, but, but the service I'd particularly like to take you to is their sanctuary for people experiencing a crisis. Although it's funded by the uh, NHS, it, uh, it, it operates under a, a kind of different set of rules, if you like, uh, and it has, is having the most extraordinary impact, very similar actually to the point you were making, so about your experiences, because people can go there in their time of, in their time of need. And it is the mod, to me, it's the modern asylum. It's a safe space where people can go and, and benefit. And then at, just at the other end of the spectrum, because I think we've talked quite a lot about what essentially, essentially is supporting your own well-being. I, I, the, the piece of work that we've done recently looking at employers, uh, we've seen some really great examples from uh, organisations who you wouldn't necessarily expect to be good at supporting their staff, uh, normally led by people with their own experiences, championing their championing mental health inside their workplace, doing very positive work. And in fact, the, uh, one of the winners of this was uh, with of our we right now run in mind our workplace wellbeing index, which allows organisations to benchmark against other organisations. And um, uh, to our surprise, uh, the Environment Agency won. Uh, last year, and they're doing some fantastic work with supporting their staff in a way, you know, that would uh, that is not at all about. I mean, in fact, you know, diagnostic labels are nowhere near. Uh, it's absolutely <laughs> about supporting people. But it is about supporting people's mental well-being, and and in order for them to be able to and thinking about their staff as people rather than just as people who turn up at work. And very, very impressive for a large-ish public sector-funded body. Thank you. Great question. One more question. Oh, <laughs> a positive story. Okay, myself is I am my own positive story around mental health. Thirteen years ago, I experienced an emotional crisis, which uh, I ended up sucked into the the mental health system. I was hospitalised, and my recovery, and the reason that I'm here today, is that I was lucky enough, we spoke about this earlier, Jack, we, we, I was lucky enough to find somebody who would listen to my story. And that's what made the change for me. I think it starts off by uh, what we're, how, how we're thinking about this issue inside, inside schools, actually, and the conversation that we have around um, you know, the way in which we describe our feelings, our emotions, the way in which we talk about uh, the, the, the good things that happen to us, but the negative things that happen to us. So I think I would take it into a very grand, quite a grounded space uh, to help and support and bring people to think about who they are as individuals and what they bring, what they bring to a wider society. And, uh, you know, I, I think we are having some of these quite deep conversations at the moment because of the kind of world in which we uh, live. Um, uh, and, and to some extent, we don't want mental health to be in the middle of that. I think we want mental health to be a part of those conversations because it goes, you know, it goes beyond our mental health. It goes into a much broader conversation about what kind of a society do we want to live in, both you know, locally and nationally and internationally. OK, Paul, thank you. A brief response. Uh, Two-second reply. I mean, I very much agree with what you said, and I think the fundamental shift we need to make is towards recognising. I think recognising that actually has to be the first step. We're not dealing with mental illnesses. We're dealing with human suffering. I'm going to do a four-second plug. I and colleagues have been involved in a very ambitious project to outline a conceptual alternative to psychiatric diagnosis, which is based on exactly that kind of understanding this is about human suffering. If you Google power, threat, meaning, framework, you'll find it, and that'll keep you happily engaged for at least a month. <laughs> <laughs> power, threat, meaning, Six framework. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. I think you'll like it, from what you said. <laughs> Thank you. Jo? Um, yeah, great question. I think the reference to philosophy is really important, actually. and I, I, I'm with the existentialists. I like the idea of 
you know, we all experience a range of human emotions and it shouldn't necessarily be about good and bad, it's just the whole thing, it's the nature of being human. Um, I'm not a fan of the phrase one in four people have a mental illness because I think four in four people experience mental distress at different parts of our lives and yeah, I think that that conversation could go a hell of a lot further. Good question. Thank you, Joe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, inevitably, as with all these things, we are running out of time. Um, so before we finish, um, I would sincerely like to thank our panel for uh, their input this afternoon. It's been very interesting for me. I hope the same comes for you. Um, so for Paul, Lucy and Joe, could we have a round of applause? Please? And because we're at Ledbury Poetry Festival, it would be criminal <laughs> not to finish with poetry. So I'm delighted to introduce Jo, who is going to finish our event with her own work. So this is a poem that um, I've shared at all the A Disorder for Everyone events so far that me and Lucy have taken around the country. Um, and it's quite a hard-hitting poem, it's quite a challenging poem, but really the, the majority of the feedback we've got is that it resonates for people, and as long as it keeps doing that, I'll keep sharing it. So, pleasure to be asked to, to do it today, David. Now, this is inspired by a woman called Eleanor Longdon, who was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and her story, the, the distress that she experienced that led to that diagnosis, and, you know, was... was was pretty much ignored and the diagnosis became her story and so she did a TED talk and the TED talk is, is Eleanor talking about all of this and one of the things she says in a TED talk is that the main question in psychiatry shouldn't be what's wrong with you, it should be what happened to you and my poem is called I'm with her so I'm with her like, not on the fence. Because surely mental health is linked to experience, so often a direct consequence of trauma, of oppression. I don't know about you, but I'm getting the impression that we've been tricked, like really good and proper, into feeling, believing that these problems tell us about us, about who we are, rather than what it was that actually carved the scar. You see, we're fooled into thinking that it's about biology, physiology, intrinsic to identity. They tell us that it's in our genes, instead of being in the scenes of what happens to us that play out on repeat sometimes. You know, the ones we don't mention too much. Our great-grandmothers. Our great-grandmothers were locked away, incarcerated, left to decay, sometimes shackled with metal vices while slices of their brains were cut out to exercise the threat. And yet this meant that sometimes they forgot the horrors, but it also meant that sometimes they forgot their names. And our grandmothers, it's not gonna come as a huge surprise that many of our grandmothers were tranquilized, pretty much sedated, and this equated to a kind of half-life, often for their entire life. And when this didn't quite sort them out, make them sane, they may well have been strapped down whilst electricity was shot into their brain. And our mothers, our mothers, were flooded with old-school antidepressants and mass unnecessary womb extractions and reactions to instant hormones that, for some, meant a detour around a midlife rite of passage that may have brought them home. And as for our sisters and as for ourselves, well, we are labelled and medicated, disorders allocated, often accumulated because there's no shortage of diagnostic criteria to explain any deliria or otherwise. Honestly, you'd be surprised. There's a disorder for everyone. What, you haven't been diagnosed yet? You just haven't been in the wrong place, saying the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time? Arbitrary look, nothing else. There is a disorder for everyone. They're in the book, it's the DSM-5, it's the place from where they all derive hundreds of them all squashed in, all planned, because supply and demand doesn't work too well without the demand bit. So our disorder has to fit and we need the pills to cure it, to cure us, be our defence chemical compounds of modern science that conveniently turn off 
or tone down our emotions, our feelings, whilst pharmaceuticals are profiting so much they're wheeling and are dealing with governments, creating policy? Is it not an atrocity that drug companies have any say in the big decisions of the day? And I know, I get it, I'm ranting now. But here's the thing, subtly hidden away underneath the anti-stigma, shiny-surfaced campaigns of the day of mental health awareness raising that are so good at glazing over the point and over the pain, we find more of the same. Hidden away is more of the same, and excuse the pun, but this is sending me insane, because now even the good ones are having a try, you know, the likes of Ruby Wax and good old Stephen Fry, sadly still perpetuating the same old toxic lies and generally doing a great job of using celebrity status to pathologise. So we all get to believe in that it is about <coughs> us. They say mental health is like physical health, and alongside that invariably, a belief that it's part of identity, part of me, the heart of me that is here to stay, not going away, needs to be managed, contained, needs to be chemically explained. So we really need a rethink, and it's definitely time to change. Because otherwise, precisely nothing is being rearranged, and we'll see a continuation of the same old, same old shit. Convenient, disempowering medical model rhetoric. We'll see confusion and delusion and collusion with social control. And where the hell in all of this is oppression's role or trauma's role? It's not getting a look in, let alone being explored. So all of our stories join the millions of others that have been conveniently ignored because trauma can't be relevant. It's too much of a threat to the general scheme of things. Instead, we should forget, forget about what's happened and put it down to genes, to chemical chaos, predisposition, the biological machine. You know, Eleanor Longdon, she was never, ever asked about anything that had happened to her or any of her past. They just said she had an illness, a kind of broken brain, and that this explained the voices and the corresponding pain, so diagnosed with schizophrenia and written off as a hopeless case. And yeah, you may be thinking this is an absolute disgrace, but it's really no exception. It's happening every day, and it's time to change the script now and find another way. And in Eleanor's amazing TED Talk, she says, the main question shouldn't be what's wrong with you. It should be what happened to you. Thank you.